I always say that the most successful artists are the ones who can make money. Why? Well, making money by doing what you love allows you to buy the time freedom to do even more of it. And this means controlling your own time and working on and in the craft for as long as you might want to. But turning your craft into money is a skill. Don't get me wrong. It is a skill that takes time. But trust me, with some upfront effort, some forward planning, and just a little bit of luck, you can start to monetize your craft and start to make a living doing what you love. Now, in this video, I'm going to be sharing with you nine of my favorite streams of income that I personally use that allows me to remain a full-time creative in a mostly passive manner. But before I do, just know that there's actually no such thing as truly passive income. Every income stream that you make requires some level of upfront effort, some level of maintenance or some level of upkeep. But the idea is that you're able to put in just a little bit of effort and then you're able to keep making money while you sleep. That to me is passive income and it's just smart. Oh, and also every single one of these is a long-term play. I'm talking about months or years here, not weeks or days. So prepare yourself to put in the work consistently for an unknown period of time. All right, let's dive in with number one, starting a YouTube channel. This has quickly become one of my favorite ways to make money as a creator because it has so many flow on effects. Not only do you generate money with AdSense on YouTube, but it can also serve as a vehicle to build an audience or get sponsorships. And it's just a great lead magnet to the other offerings that you might have as well in your business. Now, when it comes to ads and AdSense, what you wanna be aware of is what your RPM is or your revenue per mille. This is the amount of money that YouTube will give you per 1000 views. Now, the thing with RPM is that it changes sometimes drastically, depending on the time of year, depending on the industry that you might be in, depending on what's happening with the market and how much competition there is. And, you know, it also aggregates all of your premium revenue, your super chat and your memberships and all these other different factors as well. And for me, AdSense money isn't a super big amount, at least not yet, but it is significant enough that it does pay my rent every single month. So it is certainly nothing to scoff at. And it's something that I for sure would love to keep working on and keep improving. Now, my channel has a, a rough RPM of around $8, which after doing some research on other industries and that kind of stuff is about average you know sometimes i see industries like finance get rpms of like 30 dollars, which is absolutely insane but then i see sometimes there's industries like you know self-development or travel they get rpms of like one to five dollars you know before you get into youtube take a look and see what industry you're in and what the general rpms are to get an idea of how many views you would need to make the money that you need to make but the other side of YouTube is that it is a fantastic place to build an audience. And when you have an audience, you can do some really, really cool stuff with that. You know, especially if your audience is niched down and, and targeted, you can create things and sell it to your audience. And we will be covering this in the next few revenue streams. Now, things like sponsorships and paid videos aren't really passive per se, because the client will pay for either the ad read or the full video or something like that. And that usually requires some level of effort, but it's definitely worth mentioning here because some creators can really make absolute bank from sponsorships and regular retainers raking in hundreds, but more likely thousands, depending on how many subscribers or you know regular views the channel gets. Number two, selling tools of the trade. So regardless of the creative medium you engage in, there are for sure going to be tools of the trade that you can create and then sell. So for example, if you are a photographer, you can sell your Lightroom presets. If you are a videographer, then you can sell lots, for example. If you're a typographer, you can sell Procreate templates or you can sell fonts, right? If you are a user interface designer, you can sell pre-made UI kits. The general idea here is that you are selling the tools that you use every single day to other people who also engage in the same medium that you do, and that helps people be more efficient with their work. 
So for me, for example, I sell Lightroom presets. I have presets in the categories of landscape and street and portrait and urban. And these are my personal presets that I use for every single image that I create. And they're a significant starting point for me in my edits. And they really kickstart my workflow and save me a lot of time. The great thing about selling tools of the trade is that you're probably already going through the process of creating these tools for yourself anyway to become more efficient or at least I hope you are. So the process of extracting them and then packaging them into something that you can sell is a pretty easy process. And once you do it once, it's done. And if you want to update it, it's also fairly easy as well because you can update your own tools and then you can go and update your product as well. Now, I would say that the hardest thing about selling tools of the trade is that everyone else does it too. So it's a very saturated market for every medium of visual art. That being said, it definitely doesn't hurt to do. And I'm sure there is someone out there who is interested in your tools of the trade. Number three, selling an ebook. This is another one of my favorites. So as far as I know, I was the first creator to do location-based photography specific guides targeting travelers and photographers. And many, many years ago, I launched my first ebook, my photography guide to Tokyo. And it was a smash hit. And then I followed it up a few years later with my photography guide to Japan. And since then, the idea of doing photography specific location guides has spread quite a lot. And I've seen many other creators from all over the world start to do photography specific location guides as well. And, you know, this is just one way that you could do an ebook, right? One way that you could create an ebook. And the general idea of creating ebooks is to, you know, package up all of your knowledge about something specific and then present it in a way that is highly condensed, saving the reader time from having to either learn the material themselves or having to research and discover things on their own. And I love this method of passive income because although the initial effort is, you know, quite high, especially if you care about making the best product possible, the return that you get is virtually all profit because it is all digital. Now, what I don't like about this space though, is that there are so many people who either, you know, copy ideas, locations, or just don't deliver a high quality product. You know, for me and my Japan guide, for example, is over 300 pages long. And it took me five years of discovering and adventuring hardcore. And it took me seven months to write. And, you know, it's this high quality because I can't morally justify putting something out there in the world that is any lower quality than that and having people pay for it. You know, it just doesn't sit right with me. And I've seen way too many creators try to cash in on their audiences and create subpar eBooks and subpar products. And it's just kind of nasty. So don't be like that. Make something that you are proud of. Number four, selling a course. If you're world-class at something or a professional, or you're just really good and you've got a really good knack for teaching, then this income stream is for you. I love teaching as you know already because you are watching this channel and I love creating courses for people to learn from. Again, the idea here is that if you've got a skill set, especially one that is worth something or can be converted into a career or is marketable, then condensing all of your learnings and packing it up and presenting it into something you can sell is always going to be a great idea. For me personally, I've got a Lightroom course and a photography fundamentals course, and I've loved seeing the thousands of students come out of that and improve their photography substantially. I get emails emails and messages from students all of the time. And it's super, super rewarding. And I only ever want to do more. And I wish I had the stamina and endurance to do so. The thing with making courses though, is that it, it, it does take a significant amount of time to put together, you know, deciding, you know, what to teach, deciding what the curriculum is going to be and how the students are going to digest it and how it all flows together and how they're going to learn and how you're going to structure everything in a way that is pain free and seamless, right? Understanding the students and knowing what pain points they have and developing empathy for their journey. You know, a lot of thought goes into the process of making a course. And for my courses, again, like making any product, I want them to be the highest quality that I can make them, right? I want to set my students up for lifetime success. And for my last course, you know, I wrote over 200,000 words for it. That is the equivalent of two full-size 
novels. And then I condensed it down to 100,000 words and delivered it via 10 hours of video content. And this took me the better part of the year to do. And I'm super proud with how both of my courses turned out. And, you know, they are priced the way they are because I know they're super high quality and that they get results. That being said, again, it's not uncommon to see creators just take advantage of their audience and create something low effort and just flog it off. And that's really sad to see. So again, don't be like that and try to give your audience the best of yourself if you can. The thing about courses is that they do cost quite a bit for students just in general. And that means you're gonna be selling a lot less of them in the long run. However, courses for many creators can be some of the highest revenue generating income streams that they have. I know that's the case for me. And once you've built it and it's good to go, it's pretty much passive income because all you have to do is support your community and update the product every once in a while. Number five, creating a membership program. YouTube membership, Patreon, private website memberships and membership programs just in general are a great way to have recurring income and cash flow if you can pull it off. Memberships are great because they're consistent recurring income. You know how much you're going to get every single month and so long as you are providing people with value, people will stay. And depending on what you charge, memberships can be more accessible price-wise. So if the membership benefits that you're providing outweigh the price of admission, well, you've got a winner on your hands. I used to have an active Patreon and YouTube membership program, but I recently decided to get rid of it because I couldn't invest the time into it to make it the quality that I wanted. And I couldn't morally justify people paying for something that was subpar from you know my opinion, even if it does support me and even if it was to support me. But there are so many creators out there absolutely killing it with their memberships. And if you have an active following and people want to see you succeed, well, you know, having some kind of membership program is a great way to support your most loyal followers and for them to support you. And it's a great way to extend and to build your community around you. I personally recommend Patreon as a service. It's been really good to me in you know the, the many years that I used it in the past. And you know in the early days, Patreon was a lot harder than what it is now because people didn't really trust it as a platform. But nowadays, you know, lots of people know what it is. So it's definitely a platform that people turn to now and is definitely worth considering. One thing to consider though, is that memberships can be kind of tricky, right? Getting people to jump platforms for you, if that's the case, you know, if people don't usually use Patreon or whatever platform you decide to go on, it can be hard for them to create an entire account on a platform they don't use just for you. There's a lot of resistance there, but you know, yeah, if you can pull it off, then it is a really great revenue stream for passive-ish income. Number six, investing in stocks. Alrighty, a little bit out of the ordinary here, and I don't want to dwell on this too much because this isn't a finance channel and there are plenty of finance channels on YouTube who will talk about this way better than me. But as a creator, I think it's a great idea to put some of the income that you get into stocks and have that as an investment vehicle that you can use for the long run. I also think that stocks are just a great diversification away from anything too creator specific, you know, allowing you to have income in places, even if your creator income goes away, like true diversification, right? Ideally, you want to have revenue streams across many different industries and many different methods so that you can personally succeed regardless of what happens to the rest of the world and the time or the phase that we're in. Now, in terms of method and this passive income, some people love to buy stocks from companies that will pay them a regular dividend, which means that the company will give you a little bit of percentage of the profit that it made periodically. And if you have enough stocks from enough companies over time, you can make a little nice nest payment for yourself that you can live uh, off for the long term. Now, personally, for me, I just reinvest my dividend payments back into purchasing new stocks, but that's just me personally. And all right, moving on to something more creator specific. Number seven, affiliate marketing. Affiliate marketing is one of those things that I think is as close to true passive income as you're going to get. 
it's perhaps the lowest setup cost in terms of effort and once it's done it's kind of just done you just sit back and hopefully let the money come through that being said it is not the highest return for sure but for the amount of work that it takes to set up it's most certainly worth it in my opinion so with affiliate marketing the way i see it is that you're usually doing one of two things you are either actively endorsing the product and you are supplying your audience and your users with a discount link or a support link or something like that in order to get a kickback from the sale of that product or you are passively endorsing that product by joining an affiliate program and adding a link to something like an Amazon page for someone to buy that product and then you get a kickback in that way. Now, I don't have an active endorsement in anything, but I do passively endorse most of the things that I personally use or can recommend. And that's why you will see all of these links in my YouTube descriptions or in my gear page on my website. Most of the time, I'm doing that as a part of the Amazon affiliate program, where if someone clicks on any one of my links for any of the things that I share, I'll get a very small kickback amount for anything they buy on Amazon, which is great. So please use those links if you can. On the whole, this doesn't net me that much money, maybe just a few hundred dollars a month, but you know, something is better than nothing and it certainly accumulates over time. But for some other creators, they've done it really, really well. And for them, it can net them thousands of dollars a month, which is absolutely nothing to scoff at. And the best part about it is that once it's all set up, it requires next to no maintenance. So the sooner you get something up and running, the better. Now, in addition to this, if you decide to go down this route, I recommend signing up for a product called Genius Link, which is basically a link shortener, not that Amazon affiliate links aren't short already, but what it does is that it allows you to make sure that those links that you shorten go to the specific Amazon websites for that country because the Amazon affiliate program is per country and per market. Basically, the user will click that one link and be given the option to go to the relevant stores. Now, this isn't sponsored. Uh, this is just what I personally use and I've personally had great success for it and it definitely has increased my revenue over time. Number eight, licensing your work. Licensing your work can be a really, really big revenue generator if you know the right people and have really good work. With licensing, everyone first thinks of things like stock photography websites or stock video and, and that kind of route. You know, while sure, that's fine, it, it is very, difficult to make any kind of significant return from it. And especially nowadays, right, when the market is so saturated, you really have to be doing it full time for a little while to get things going. What I really mean by licensing your work is providing permission for a commercial entity to use your images or your video or your paintings or your drawings or your media for a fee under specific conditions. You know, ideally, the same piece of work could be licensed to many businesses for many things. And as a creator of the work, depending on how the image is going to be used, you can charge different amounts for the varying levels and varying methods of the license. And I think it's quickly worth at this point to pause and mention the idea of intellectual property. You know, the things that you make, the photos, the videos, whatever, these things are your intellectual property you own them. If you're a videographer and you've been hired to make a video of your local pizza shop, unless it's been stated otherwise in a contract, that video that you take for the job doesn't belong to the pizza shop. It belongs to you. If you're a photographer and you're taking images of a product for a company for a job, again, unless stated otherwise in a contract, those images belong to you, not the company of the product. When you make things, you hold the copyright. The right to copy, the right for duplication and distribution belongs to you. Think of the things that we make like a product. In business, no company survives by giving their product out for free. Right? If a piece of art or media has any value to anyone, then that value is worth being paid for. So charge for your work. Exposure or being tagged or credited for an image doesn't put food on the table. Now, what you'll start to find is that when you build your portfolio and your exposure and your notoriety in your field, in your industry, 
people will start to approach you because they love certain images or videos you've made or certain projects that you've been involved in or whatever the case may be. Now, this isn't a video about the ins and outs of licensing. That's a whole other video topic all on its own. But I will mention quickly before wrapping this point up that where the media goes and where it's distributed matters. What you want to include in your licenses are the rights to your media. Rights management is what it's called. You know, basically controlling the parameters of time, format, coverage, distribution method, period, region, and industry. You know, all of those different variables should have different prices for them. For example, a piece of media being distributed worldwide is going to cost more than something that is just going to be in one country, right? A license that covers only social distribution is going to cost a lot less than the license that covers, you know, web, print, app, and TV. You know, a license that is valid for one year is going to cost a lot less than a license that is valid in perpetuity. And there's a lot of variables that are a whole minefield, but it's worth figuring out all of this for yourself because the money can be quite a bit if you get some very strong commercial clients. You know, with commercial budgets, just in general, we're talking, you know, five digits minimum for many projects, sometimes six digits, depending on what you're doing. Now, sometimes the work isn't super passive and there's definitely some upfront time and energy cost to creating the media in the first place, but it is definitely worth it if you are good at negotiating your license as well. And even more so if you can negotiate retainers or recurring payments as well. Number nine, running ads on your products or platforms. All right, last one here. So regardless of what platform you have, if you have a platform, you can run ads on it. As much as people love to hate to admit it, ads run the world and it's what keeps capitalism going. You know, on YouTube, YouTube runs ads on your videos, but your videos are your product. And when you do sponsorship spots on your videos, you're effectively running ads on your product. Now, doing ad reads or sponsored videos, again, really isn't a passive way of earning income per se, but you can really start to get creative with how this all works. So for me personally, I run Google display ads on my website. So when you read an article on my blog on my website, it has ads on it. And I choose how many and where and how often and whenever someone clicks or views those ads, I get a little bit of a kickback, very similar to how Google AdSense works for views on a YouTube video. To really ramp this up and take this to the next level, I personally use a service called Mediavine, which is a full service ad management agency, and they manage all of the ads that get shown on my website. And they give me a kickback of several hundred dollars per month for essentially just setting up the ads and sitting back and doing nothing. And it's, you know, it's great. But that's only because I've built my website to have constant and returning organic traffic and a reader base. Another example that I'm trying to build up over time is to start running ads on my new newsletter, Creative and Process. So I basically want to build up the subscriber base there to as big as it can be by providing you know, unique, fresh content about the creative process. But eventually, once it's big enough, let's say like 100,000 subscribers or something like that, I can start charging for ad space within the newsletter every single week. Now, this is very quite far future, but I'll see how the newsletter goes throughout the rest of the year. So subscribe now for free if you are interested. Anyway, whatever platforms, audiences or products you have, so long as there are people there, you can run ads on those things. Now, whether or not they are recurring or one time is very context dependent, but usually the recurring ones will net you more over the long run. All right, that's it. That's my nine favorite income streams that I personally use as a creator. There are definitely more, but you know, these are my favorite and these are the ones that I personally recommend that every creative person start to think about and get involved in. Let me know down in the comments below if you have any questions or if you'd like to see a deep dive video on any of these income streams. But if you like this video, then you will probably like this one too, where I talk about how to become a full-time artist without social media. All right, that's it for this video and I'll see you on the next one. But until then, get out there and make something that matters. Peace.